about 2006 or seven, I had the wine bug. I got the wine bug and I was writing and I was working in um, a firm that Citigroup had bought right around that time. I, I was I was writing, but I was still like a trader and doing that most of the time. And a girl broke up with me and I was having a bit of a midlife crisis. My writing hadn't, you know, exploded. And um, I started falling in love with wine and decided I'm going to go and get into the wine business. I'm going to start a vineyard and, you know, maybe even go back to school and study enology. So I headed to Washington State because I'd been drinking a lot of Washington State wines and really, let's, I mean, it was probably because of Kurt Cobain that I had such a fascination with Washington State in the first place. So I, when I knew I was going to get into the wine business, I looked at Paso Robles and Santa Barbara and McMinnville and Oregon, of course, Sonoma and Napa. And uh, then this little place called Red Mountain in Washington State, because I really liked their wines. And I went out to visit and I don't know what it was. It was just not like the middle of nowhere, but I pulled up and I was like, this feels to me like where I belong. And so I went back and quit my job, packed up, drove a U-Haul out there and um, very quickly found my place. Like just knocking on doors saying, this is who I am. I want to break into the wine business, met a family called the Hedges who took me in and started teaching me all about farming and um, viticulture and making wine. And really, it just, it was amazing. And because we're out in the middle of nowhere with a bunch of wine geeks, it was either you're like a rodeo rider, you farm wheat or cherries, or you're here to be in the wine business. And so there's these just incredibly diverse, colorful characters everywhere you turn. And you don't live there unless you one of those people that doesn't get bored because there's not much to do other than, you know, do wine stuff or cook or bake or work on your motorcycle or go to the rodeo or and stuff. And these are just super eccentrics. And it, it didn't take long to realize, oh my God, I can just take all these guys, throw them in a blender, change their names, steal some ideas and make it, make it a story. And, um, I knew I knew I at that point that I was abandoning thrillers and just dealing with people who were fighting for their uh, lives, fighting for happiness and fighting to make this Red Mountain place a very special uh, appellation like Napa. Everything I write has to do with my experiences because it's what I know, but it's more people I've met and I, I find a way to connect with all of them. But I think by then I'd shaken loose all the autobiographical stuff. And it was more about like, I started to, I think this happens as you develop as an author, I started to see these characters not as me on in any way, but as, you know, this is Otis, this is a man who lost his wife and two sons. He grew up in England, moved to Montana, then found his way to Sonoma. And I started to see him in his head as his own person. And the same with Margot and her story from Vermont and stuff. And what I what was really good for me and super challenging was with this story, the point of view changed every chapter. So it was like Superman, you had to run into the phone booth, change your suit, come back in for the next chapter, switch it over. And I got pretty good at, you know, this chapter is about Margo. Zoop, I'm Margo now and write for a while and then change to Otis. And, and I think that was, a, it was such a big that was the book that really defines my whole career because it was so, it taught me everything. And at the same time, I was finding my voice. I was stepping away from the autobiographical thing. And it's where I found my readers too, which, which was big. I've always been a big Europe person. And the family that I worked for in Washington, uh, she was from Champagne. And so I like, when I met them, I became introduced to European wines and European food in the real way. And so that started to pull me big time. But even long before that, I love Pat McCon Conroy's book set in Rome and Amor Toll's book, The Gentleman in Moscow. I loved how, uh, oh, um, All the Light We Cannot See, Anthony Doerr, he lived in Italy for that. Um, I loved these authors that were spending a year somewhere else and writing a book. So I was really pulled to it in that regard. And then it came down to what story am I going to try to tell? Because my wife and I committed to go to Spain 
And I knew it had to be about an American who was a fish out of water in Spain, because, you know, it's so easy to see, especially if you, if you move there and you learn like there's so much romance in Spain, it's just thick with it. It's beautiful. And like your life slows down. However, as an American like me, who can be a bit of a workaholic and, you know, get up and I want to just get shit done. And why is, why is this store closed right now? I need this. Or you're telling me I need to go get in line for an hour and a half to renew my um, visa or, you know, some of the stuff that's taken for granted of here is tough over there. So the last piece, so I knew, started to see my character from there of like, hey, I'm going to just exacerbate, make make the American, ultra American, like cliche American, you know, workaholic. Um, and And then I guess the last piece was, yeah, there were so many interesting articles at that time around the DNA and genealogy and stuff. And um, that just seemed only perfect to make some to, to get them over there. So we decided to move to Valencia because we have a we had an eight year old at the time. He's nine now. And um, we wanted to make sure he went to a good Montessori school and we weren't like ripping him out. Um, and so we wanted to be in the city. So we went to Valencia um, but uh, and found a great flat in the city. It was so inspiring. And Valencia is a great area because you're an hour away from great wine regions and olive oil vineyards. And I'm, one of my friends is one of the leading um, olive oil experts in the country, probably the world. And I reached out to her and I said, can you uh, introduce me to some olive oil uh, or olive uh, orchard people, growers? And she introduced me to like two of the cult uh, growers in the world, like people that the Manhattan chefs are praising and pouring their oils and stuff. So we, we got a chance to go stay at some of their spots on, on their orchards and live on their farms and do tours with them and stuff. And that was extraordinary. That really kind of drove it home. And then we, of course, went wine tasting all over and um, just traveled a lot. It was during COVID. We were there during the whole time of COVID. And for about six months, you couldn't leave your territory. So the Valencian Comunidad, we could not leave it unless you had an excuse. And I had a um, piece of paper typed out from my publisher to show if I need be. So we would go on road trips and it was just our little, you know, whatever rental car it was and trucks. And we were just cruising around Spain by ourselves, no traffic at all, um, just studying and researching. It was just amazing. Oh. Uh What's coming, up next? What's coming up next? I am. I went to Winchester, UK in January, and I'm writing my first proper dual timeline, um, including the other time, present day, and then a timeline set in 1881, which is, I don't know if you've written any historical stuff before. It is not easy. I mean, I have no idea what I'm doing, and I often, I had a bit to write today and I'm totally procrastinating, but I sit down and I'm like, are you kidding me? What, what are you doing trying to write Victorian era England characters? Um, but it's about a, a woman in Boston who finds out through this holistic um, healer that all her struggles could be because of something someone in her family did bad years ago. And she goes on a mission to go find the roots of her family. So another really genealogy story and try to figure out this crime that might have been committed and how it's traveled down through the years. So I guess it's a bit mystery, mystery like it's called When All the Lights Turn Green. He reminds me of a couple of real people on Red Mountain. And Red Mountain is like a really special appellation in Washington in that it, people know the name Red Mountain in Sweden and Japan and stuff, but it's super small. And there's only a few wineries but it's because of the dedication of a few men and women who've just been at it since the 70s and 80s and my one of my best friends and my colleague for a lot of years Christoph Hedges he's my age is kind of inherited his family's position and took on his mother's champenois mindset and never have I seen a man more obsessed over something and his full mission in life when he wakes up is to make Red Mountain world renowned, internationally known. And he'll do anything, anything to make that happen. So that concept feeds into Otis. 
And when you know what a man wants, you can see him so clearly. And all that Otis wants is for Red Mountain to make wines that are true and that are of the quality of the other renowned growing regions in the world, Burgundy and Bordeaux. And as soon as he starts doing absurd stuff, then you're like, oh, okay, there's no stopping this man. The title for the first time ever uh, is called Red Mountain Calling. And I, I know that um, I, I've gotten tons of TV interest. That's the big thing that I'm just excited about and, and getting closer to. And it's something that is such like a, um, a long process, but it gets to keep. So it always keeps in my head because I have producers reaching out and we have these conversations and stuff. But I think with book four, it'll it'll be set a year later. And um, it all starts with with. Uh, Otis, who's le who left in the last book, he's going to be called back. 